Welcome to the world of ancient Egypt. Almost 10,000 years ago, along the banks of the River Nile, a, civiliz a civilization developed that would become the longest continuous culture in human history. For over 8,000 years, the people of Egypt lived according to the annual rhythms of the flooding Nile, and this left them with rich deposits of topsoil, and thus the river became the anchor to their lives. The early Egyptians were forced to work together because they had to work together to harness the river. They built dams and canals and there developed a culture in which the rulers, it was a theocracy, so the rulers were considered divine beings. And in Egyptian culture, the afterlife, the life after death, was the axis that was sort of the center of their religion. The dynasties of ruling families formed along the river and yet these ruling families were considered to be half sort of part God, part human. This is probably pretty good when things are going well, but when things went not quite so well, like let's say you had a little plague, a little flood, then that might not be so good to be the half God, half man ruler. And sometimes the dynasties were replaced. Now, the first time that there was a large-scale archaeological expedition from outside of the area was led by Napoleon in 1798. He brought 200 scientists with him on this expedition and ended up bringing home all this material which made everything that was from Egypt all the rage in Europe. Let's talk a little bit about the Egyptian style, which you can see here clearly pictured. I'm going to read the italicized uh, text here, and you need to know this. The head is seen in a profile, but the eyes look as if they're seen from the front. The shoulders are facing the viewer, but the hips are in profile. The feet are flat to the ground, and there is no shading. The figures have no individual features. Okay, I challenge all of you to try to stand like this. It's impossible. And yet when you look at the tombs of royalty, they all had the same basic stance. This is repeated throughout Egypt and miraculously, incredibly, it did not change for thousands of years. Now the people that were the royal or the priestly classes are shown very stylized and they have really no individual features. But if you look at the examples that are more um, the working class, they had a lot of individual features. They looked a lot more human. The Egyptian religion was centered around the afterlife, and they built elaborate tombs in, to ensure that their rulers had a safe passage. Now these tombs, these celebrations of death, are the source of most of what we know about Egyptian life today. The artists of the time followed these strict guidelines. They were called a canon or a convention. This to guide them in how they created their work. And that was how it, that was why it all looks the same. If we look on the left, we have an unfinished tomb from the Valley of the Kings. And this provides a wonderful example to show us how the artists actually worked. You can see that they made these scale drawings. They put the lines in. They fit them exactly in place. And then they went back and they removed stone to carve out some areas. So that's a relief sculpture. Relief sculpture, you could say, is slightly indented sculpture. Sculpture that is mostly flat, rather than sculpture that's in the round, which means that you can walk all the way around it. Now, one way to remember what relief is, is to look at the penny. That's a relief sculpture. So let's look a little bit more at the common people. All right, so if you're a royal person, you're a priest, you have high status in society, and you're dying, you go to the afterlife, then you're going to have to take some, you know, some servants with you. You're going to have to have food and, and services once you get over to the beyond the beyond. So what they did in Egyptian society was they made what we call grave goods. In this wonderful example above, somebody's making bread, it looks like they're slaughtering a cow. It looks like one woman is kind of doing push-ups, but I think that's the artist, artistic license of this particular artist. I think somebody's throwing a pot there. So this was something, this object would go into the grave and it gives us in modern day times as we've discovered these objects, it gives us a great glimpse into the ordinary life of Egyptians. Now I really like this uh, guy on the right. 
he's a little potter. But if you look below at the lower photo, you can see he's a really skinny little potter. And this artist has gone so far as to carve each of his little ribs in the back. You could say this was a good example of how everyday life, people who worked doing the trades, they were depicted quite naturalistically. Oh, one more thing to notice about these grave goods, you know, the vast majority of the tombs that were left in Egypt, they were looted. So we have a limited number of tombs to get our information from, and luckily we have found some undisturbed until modern times. And you know, the King Tut tomb, T King Tutankhamun, he was one of the, it's one of the finest tombs that we found in recent times. And what's very interesting about that is he was kind of a lesser king. There were much greater tombs that were looted and that are now gone to history. Okay, so this is a famous sculpture called the Seated Scribe. You're going, to, you're going to need to remember this sculpture. Scribes in Egypt began training at a very young age because writing was so important to the society and to their religion. They were given an honored place within that society and they wrote on something called papyrus. Papyrus is a paper that's made of river reeds where you kind of beat the reeds and you make a paper out of it. And then they went on um, also to write on vellum, which was a calf skin. Now vellum remained in use as a writing uh, surface far into the Middle Ages. Most of the written records, which were extensive, were eventually housed at a great library in the city of Alexandria. Now this library was burned by invading armies about the time of Christ. So now about all that we have left to really study Egyptian society would be the tombs. Um, this, the Egyptians were obsessed with life after death, as I said, and this obsession led them to build tombs that were full of records of their lives. So this keeps the ancient culture alive for scholars and historians. I find that a wonderful irony. Let's talk about the pyramids. Hey, you know what? You do not need to remember that these pyramids are Egyptian. That's because I think you already know that, right? Everybody knows the Great Pyramids. Well, let's find out a little bit more about them. Let's look at them a little bit more. One of the things about the Great Pyramids is um, they were built over a period of 86 years. Now, do you know that each of the pyramids is actually a tomb for one king? Okay, and they were built about 2500 BC. So we have three pyramids, each for a king. The tombs were built for three kings. The largest pyramid is 450 feet high. So think about a 48-story building. That's how high they were. And at the time they were built, they had this great light veneer of granite, white granite. And you can still see that on the top of the middle one pictured above. I love to think about that, when they were all covered with white and the sun would hit them. Now the pyramids had four sides, count them, four. And they're said to represent the rays of the sun. So just remember that the pyramids had four sides. I'm going to talk briefly about how it worked. When a king died on one side of the Nile, uh, the, where the royal palace was, he was ferried across the river to the valley temple. And that valley temple you can see right here. Okay, And then his body was carried along this causeway here to another temple, and that was at the pyramid. So they'd go through the bathing, it was already mummified, they did all the stuff they needed to do, all their rituals, and then they would place it far within the tomb, which in this case is a gigantic pyramid. One of the ploys that they did to stop the grave robbers is that they would hide the tomb in a more, in a very hidden place, in a place that was kind of sab um, hidden, sabotaged, booby-trapped, made to look like it was not there. Well, they didn't put actual bombs or anything in it, but they would always have another tomb that was the false tomb, the one that you would think that it would be in and there would be nothing there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about constructing the pyramids. Can you, well, I could say, can you imagine, but I can't imagine. The theories really vary, and they've had several instances of people in modern times trying to reconstruct the pyramids and failing. So. You know, each stone weighs two tons, um, and they have to be completely level. And somehow, they have to meet at the top. 
Well, the latest theories, or one of the many theories as to how they actually got built, was that it was a huge labor force of people who were in the off-season while the Nile was flooding. And because the people believed that by working on the tomb and making a good afterlife for their king, they would improve their own situation, that helped them to want to do it. So there's the pyramids. Oh, this statue on the left is of Khafre, and he's one of the people who the pyramids were built for. He was one of the kings. It's also made out of that material, diorite, which is very hard, very slow to decompose, and um, a wonderful uh, material for the old sculptures. Now let's talk briefly about the Great Sphinx. One uh, interesting thing here is to note that these are scaffolding and these are people. So that's how big it is. Now another thing that's interesting, if you see it, they've taken the rocks out around the Sphinx and exposed the Sphinx. So the rocks, it's actually a quarry. They've taken the rocks that surrounded the Sphinx and used those to build the pyramid. And so we have the Sphinx. It's half king, half, I guess, lion, stands 65 feet high. So let's look at the Valley Temple. If you look below right, that's where the king's body would first land. And this is also an example of post and lentil construction, which was used to build these great temples. Need I say that again? Post and lentil construction that was used to build these great temples. Did you catch that? Better write that one down. Okay, so here's another temple complex, uh, the great temple complex at Karnak and at Luxor, where they, two different ones were built. This one is the temple to Ramses II, and he was believed to be the ruler at the time of Moses. So it's very interesting to tie in the history with, uh, uh, in some ways, the mythology and the stories that have come up around the region. Now, this breastplate above is said to have belonged to Ramses II. So isn't it something to think that this object was back, um, perhaps worn by someone in such a historical time? Now, I want to talk about Amenhotep, or um, Akhenaten. Now, he was an interesting fellow. He came along and he really disrupted society, because rather than having all the gods of the pantheon of Egyptian society, he said, no, there's only one god, and that god is the sun. And he also moved the capital from Thebes to his own city that he built. Now, what you need to know about the art with Akhenaten is that with him, art became much more naturalistic. If you look at the picture on the left, or either one, the one on the right, you can see they've got big bellies, they've got these little babies. I mean, maybe it's not perfect realism, but it's a lot more realistic than we've seen in the past. We'll see this again. When we see a picture of his famous wife, Akhenaten's wife was Nefertiti. And this particular bust was found in an artist's studio. And they say it was probably used so the artist would have a model to know what the queen looked like. So again, this is much more realistic than we've seen in the past. And the woman below, I mean, she's a little scary, but that's actually Akhenaten's mother. So again, the artist was really working to make her look realistic. Now this greatly destabilized Egyptian society, as we shall see. Cats and baboons. I've got to throw this in because we know, you know, Egyptian cats are famous, but they were also <clears throat> sacrificed. So a cat in Egyptian society did not really live that long. And they, for, as for baboons, they believed that they were sacred to the god Thoth. And this carving below is a baboon holding an eye amulet. Yeah, you know, the cats, they went until they were about 10 months old, and then they went to cat heaven as a sacrifice. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the Book of the Dead. The Egyptians believed that at our death, all of our deeds would be judged in something called the weighing of the heart. This is depicted here in this uh, painting on papyrus. Osiris, the god of the underworld, sits on his throne to the left. Above him sit 42 judges of truth. The deceased who is in question will either ascend to heaven or be eaten by a lion-headed monster. You know, I would kind of prefer heaven to the monster if it was me. But it's weighing all of their deeds, their good deeds, against a feather. 
I love that. There's an ancient Harper's song that has survived to this day, and it says, None of us can really know where we go, so we may as well enjoy today and live well while we are able. You know, I think that's a 3,000-year-old bit of advice that still applies to us today. So, um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and thank you for listening.